Corinthians. 1 Corinthians today in chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And the Lord laid this uh, scripture kind of on my heart as we're thinking in the time of the year that we're in, uh, getting ready to approach a new year. You know, most of the time when we get to the end of one year and starting another year, you know, a lot of people have different resolutions and things that they uh, want to do better in the next year. And, you know, that's really recently all we've heard about is getting to 2021. Right? Everybody's been talking about how cruddy 2020 is, and they think that when that clock, you know, strikes midnight and it goes into 2021, that all of a sudden all of our problems are going to be gone. And, you know, it's laughable when you, when you hear people, it's almost like they're mad at the year. It's like it's the year's fault. Like 2020, what a cruddy year. I can't wait till 21, stupid 2020, right? And it, it's kind of foolish because those same people who think that, you know, just by flipping a page on the calendar that all their problems are going to go away. Well, you know, if they uh, focused in on 2020 without the Lord Jesus Christ, well, 2021 without the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be the same as 2020. It's going to be another cruddy year. And, you know, I hope as the people of God, we, we can look on back on 2020 and we can count our many blessings, uh, name them one by one. You know, let's don't let the world's outlook on things be our outlook on things. Because I look back at 2020, and yeah, if we focus on, oh, we had coronavirus, we had uh, you know, all the riots and the looting. We had all the political mess. We had all the lying and all the garbage that's going on with that. You know, you can bog yourself down. But, you know, when I look back at 2020 and count my blessings, what God has done for me, in 2020, the Lord gave me a, a new baby girl, Wendy, a precious gift. And what a gift she has been. You know, she's just been a joy. Her middle name's Wendy Joy, and she has been a joy to our family. And, you know... Uh, not only that, but the Lord, uh, he healed my knee in 2020. Uh, I destroyed my knee and the Lord brought me right through that. No problems, no medical bills hanging over my head. Uh, the Lord caused me to be, allowed me to be a pastor in 2020. The Lord gave us Good News Baptist Church in 2020. Uh, the Lord brought all these people together in 2020. Uh, the, the Lord, I have had the privilege and opportunity uh, to be involved in the work of the Lord and see people uh, get saved and, and come to Jesus in 2020. And I guarantee you, ask those people, if they focus on uh, the blessing it is to have eternal life, that 2020 wasn't a bad year for them. 2020 was the year that they were born again, uh, born of God. You know, uh, so let's not say 20, you know, there's no credit years in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ, there is no bad years, okay? But, you know, it's, it's just, that's why it's, you know, it's so, you can just see where people's minds at. It's like, oh, when the calendar changes, it's going to be a whole different year, a whole different ball game. But look, if you approach 2021 without Jesus Christ, it's going to be the same as 2020. Well, you know, when you get to the end of uh, a lot of years, uh, you see, like I saw it, said, many people make a lot of resolutions, you know, things that maybe they want to do better. Uh, a lot of times it revolves around our bodies, you know, like people want to lose weight. Uh, you know, they want to get healthier. They want to eat better. Uh, they want to cut out some kind of bad habit that they have. Maybe they don't want to eat as much uh, junk food, as much sweets. Uh, they don't, people try to quit smoking or quit drinking or uh, you name it. Maybe there's other things, other directions people want to go and they want to start a hobby uh, in the next year that they want to do. Uh, they want to advance in their career or they want to... Uh, you know, grow their family, whatever, at the beginning of the year usually marks a time where people uh, try to set new goals, and it's kind of like a, a restart, a fresh start uh, for some folks. And, you know, as Christians, you know, I, you know, we talk about approaching each year with Jesus Christ and that we have good years. I don't think there's problems with setting goals and using a new year as maybe a benchmark to kind of restart a thing. If you think about it, uh, we serve a God of of new starts. Uh, you know, uh, the, the best start that any of us, restart that any of us had was being born again, uh, born of the Spirit, born of God. That's a new beginning. That's a new start, a new life in Jesus Christ that we didn't have, that we were dead in trespasses and sins before. You know, one of my favorite scriptures is in Philippians in chapter 3 where the Apostle Paul says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do... 
forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, as Christians, sometimes we have to let things go. In the past, we have to forget those things which are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before. Because our mark is Jesus Christ. And you know, anything that's holding us back from pressing towards that mark, we need to forget those things which are behind and reach forth unto those things which are before. You know, we need to start anew with some of those things. And so I have no problem with, you know, setting goals or resolutions at the beginning of the year. And that's kind of what led me to this scripture here, is that, like I said, a lot of times those goals and those resolutions revolve around bad habits or bad things or besetting sins, maybe, uh, that we want to kick, uh, that we need to get out of our lives uh, so that we can continue pressing towards that mark and continue moving forward uh, for Jesus. And in this scripture here that we're going to read in 1 Corinthians 6, I think we have some keys, some keys to allow, not allowing those things to have power in our lives, getting rid of those things or moving beyond uh, so that we can be fully committed to Jesus Christ and to him and to him being the mark. And so we're going to start here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and we're going to start reading in verse 12 and we're going to read to the end of the chapter. In verse 12, it says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Meats for the belly, and the belly for meats, and God shall destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I take then, then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that they which are joined to an harlot, he is one body? And for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God, in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. Let's pray. Dear Father, Lord, I just thank you for Sunday. Uh, Lord, we just thank you that we can come together as a church around your word. Uh, Lord, please humble us now. Give us ears to hear. Uh, Lord, please help me as I preach this, Lord, to be led by you, uh, spirit, and uh, not by uh, my own thoughts. And uh, Lord, please help us all to grow and to take away the knowledge that we need to, the Lord, to continue pressing towards uh, the mark. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So what I want to do this morning, I want to kind of go through kind of verse by verse what we just read, but then at the end we're going to make just one application around all of this. Uh, but we start here in verse 12. Now, if you remember, the, we've said this before, that in the book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the church at Corinth, which was described as a carnal church, a fleshly church with lots of problems. They had divisions, contentions. Uh, in the previous chapter, uh, the Apostle Paul was uh, exhorting them to uh, throw someone out of the church who was committing fornication. And fornication that wasn't even named among the Gentiles, that a uh, uh, man would have his father's wife, uh, is what it says. It's something that we can't imagine. I'm, I'm thinking it might have been a stepmom. I'm, hope, I'm hoping that that's the case. And so... I'm thinking that's, that would be the case. And so, <laughs> but, but anyhow, I mean, he just got through upbraiding them with that. And so we kind of get some of that carried over here into this next chapter. And in the first verse, a very uh, a great verse, uh, in verse 12, it says, All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So when he says all things are lawful for me, look, it, as born-again believers in Jesus Christ, uh, we are no longer condemned. 
The Bible says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, which walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You know, we're not saved by the law. We're not saved by our, our keeping of the law and our being go a good person or our ability to keep the commandments because none of us can. And so we have to be born again. It's a free gift of God given to us by faith in Jesus Christ. And so having that gift, you know, all things are lawful to us, meaning that, you know, we're not going to be uh, condemned uh, by the laws that we break. Uh, because God has forgiven us of every sin that we've committed in the past uh, through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, every sin that we're committing now, every sin that we're going to commit in the future has all been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and his righteousness has been given to us. Uh, and we've been made new, new on the inside, and one day we'll be made new on the outside as well too, which we're going to be talking about here soon. And so all things are lawful to us. And that's why there's some different things that changed uh, from the Old Testament to the New Testament as far as uh, they had dietary restrictions. You know, in the Old Testament, there were certain things that were marked as unclean uh, that the nation of Israel uh, could not eat. And that was a picture of, you know, the separation of God's people and people who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ uh, that were made clean in Christ and is separated from the uncleanness of our sin and of the world, and, uh, you know, again, no longer condemned. Uh, that was a picture of that. Uh, now it says in the New Testament, you know, that we're not to be judged by uh, meats or drink or according to a holy day or the new moon or the Sabbath days, all those things, and we'll read that scripture here too. Again, we're a picture. And so he's saying here, all things are lawful to me. He's saying, look, these are all lawful. I can be a partaker in all these things and not be condemned for them. But uh, not all things are expedient. Just because all these things are lawful for me, you know, I could do whatever I want and still have uh, faith in Jesus Christ. I have uh, be, not be condemned. Uh, it's not appropriate. It's not expedient. Or uh, I think I looked up a definition of expedient. It's not suitable for achieving a certain end. Uh, it's not appropriate, not suitable for achieving a certain end. We talked about pressing towards the mark. You know, there's some things that would not be expedient for us to be partakers in if we're going to press toward the mark, which is Jesus Christ. Um, and he gives some examples here as we go on. But I like what it says there at the end of verse 12. It says, but I will not be brought under the power of any. And we're going to focus on that a little bit later, but he's saying, look, all things are lawful for me, but not all expedient, and I'm not going to be brought under the power of any. Meaning, I'm not going to have anything in my life uh, that's lawful for me to do that I'm going, to, it's going to be, I'm going to be enslaved to it. That it's going to have power over me to the point where I'm more focused on that than he would be the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not going to be brought under the power of anything. He doesn't want anything to control him but the Lord Jesus Christ. In verse 13, again, he uses uh, meats as an example. Meats for the belly and the belly for meats. But God shall destroy both it and them. And so he's saying, look, our bellies were made for meat. Our bellies were made for food. God created our stomachs. Uh, so, and he designed them being uh, uh, all-knowing God uh, so that they could eat, we could eat food and digest it. God's made our belly for meats. And God's made meat for our belly. Uh, God made us to where we would need food to sustain our lives here on earth, our physical flesh. And so uh, he made food for our bellies and our bellies for food. That's what, what the Bible's saying there. But he's saying, but God shall destroy both it and them. You know, one day, uh, we're not going to need food. You know, one day, uh, these bellies that are temporary now and flesh and, uh, you know, require food, uh, one day we're not going to have bellies like that, you know, in Jesus Christ. One day, they'll both be destroyed. Uh, that should get our minds to thinking uh, uh, food and our bodies are temporary. Right? And so, again, that should just point us in the direction of we shouldn't put so much thought on what we eat, uh, on our food so much, because it's temporary. One day God's going to destroy both it and them, it says. 
And again, that's another warning by Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount where he told us not to take so much thought for those things. That he will provide us with what we're needed. And Paul's reiterating that here that God one day will destroy both it and them. He says also in verse 13, Now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Now, fornication, if you're not familiar with that word, I mean, we could just kind of use it more as an umbrella term as any kind of, um, I, I will say, sexual activity outside of the bond of marriage. Anything. So we're talking about, you know, adultery. We're talking about uh, uh, knowing uh, someone, a man knowing a woman before they're married or vice versa. We're talking about homosexuality. We're talking about all kinds that you could put under the umbrella of fornication. Anything outside of what God defines as a marriage in between, and what a married man and a woman do uh, in coming together as one flesh uh, would be, you could call it fornication. <clears throat> and so he says here, uh, now the body is not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. See, God didn't give us a body, again, so that we could just go and fornicate with it. Uh, God didn't make our bodies for the purpose of fornication. Uh, he says our bodies were made for him. You know, we were made for his pleasure. We're made for God's glory. Uh, our bodies are for him. And it says in the Lord uh, for the body. You know, uh, another verse that I kind of helps tie that together in Ephesians 5.23, it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ, is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. You know, there it's talking about the church body, but he's the savior of uh, these physical fleshly bodies too. Because it's by the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did that these bodies will be redeemed. He is the savior of the body. You know, in our church, body is, is uh, comprised of members of, of saved people who've all joined themselves together. Jesus is the savior of the body. The body is for the Lord. He's the head. Oh, we are his body. Uh, it's not for fornication. You know, as the body of Christ here, you know, uh, God didn't save us so that we could use the grace of God as lasciviousness and go out and use our physical bodies for whatever sin we want to indulge in, uh, in particular fornication. And this uh, scripture here really focuses in on the sin of fornication and how wicked of a sin that it is, uh, that it's not just a sin, it says of the spirit, but of the body that we'll read here. And look in verse 14, and it says, And God hath both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his power. Again, this is just a reminder of Jesus being our redeemer, being the savior of the body, that one day... Uh, he's going to take these vile bodies of flesh that the Apostle Paul said in Romans, that in them dwelleth no good thing, that our, 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 all the sin and wickedness that we commit that's all dwells within our flesh. Well, one day, just as the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, conquering uh, death, conquering hell, and conquering sin, uh, he is going to raise up our bodies and change them. As it says in 1 Corinthians, in a moment... In a twinkling of an eye, that our bodies are going to be changed from these vile bodies into a body like his, and our salvation will be complete. We won't just be new on the inside, but we'll also be new on the outside. Uh, go with me to the book of uh, Romans, chapter 8. Romans, chapter 8. And we'll start reading, in, uh, let's start reading in verse 9. Or we can start reading in verse 8, that's fine. The Bible says, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Remember last week, 
When Jesus was talking to the uh, man Nicodemus, he said, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So you have to be born again. You have to have the spirit of God dwelling inside of you by faith in Jesus Christ, or you're none of his, uh, the Bible says. In verse 10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. So see, even with Christ in us, our bodies, being flesh, are dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if ye lived after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify, and that word mortify means kill, mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. And so we see our hope. Our hope is that w this body of flesh, this body of sin that we have, just as the Spirit raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, uh, that we too, by that same Spirit that now dwells inside of every true believer will be raised up and these bodies will be shed. They will be uh, done away with. Again, remember, God's going to destroy both it and them. Remember that belly we were talking about? One day, this body of flesh will be changed. There will be no more. And so, therefore, as Christians, we're not debtors to serve this body. We're not to give in to the sinful lust and pleasures that our body uh, wants and desires us to do. We're debtors to the Spirit. The spirit by which we have hope, by which uh, we have life, wherein lies righteousness. We're debtors to serve God, not our flesh, and not the desires of our flesh and of our sin. We're supposed to kill those desires. It said mortify, kill those desires of the flesh. And you saw there uh, last week, again, I just point out last week, you saw there we talked about the spirit raising up Jesus Christ from the dead. Remember if last week when we were talking about Jesus being God, that's another example of uh, this, one of the persons of the Godhead raising up Jesus. That time it said the Spirit raised up Jesus from the dead. Uh, there's other scripture in John chapter 10 where Jesus said he took up his life. He raised himself from the dead. And then we have like in Romans 10, 9 and 10 that it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So see, we have all three persons of the Godhead in different verses uh, as a part of raising Jesus from the dead, showing that these three are one. Uh, just a good side note there, since we were at that scripture. But let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and keep going through these verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we left off at verse 14. Again, talking about the temporary, uh, the temporal nature of our flesh and our lustful desires, uh, that really our hope is in the Lord and that he will one day raise us up and do away with these vile bodies. But here in verse 15, now it says, Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot, God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. So first he says here, look, know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ. Look, these bodies are the members of Jesus Christ. Uh, when you become Christ and born again, uh, these members are his. They belong to him. And so he's saying if these members belong to Christ, if we're going to name the name of Jesus Christ, then should we take our bodies and join them to a harlot? So again, talking to a man, what, as a man of God, should I take my body, which is Christ, and join it to a whore? Join it to a prostitute? Join it to a lady uh, just to so fulfill the lust of that flesh. Is that appropriate? Is that expedient, obviously, for a man of God? Absolutely not. We're joining what belongs to Jesus Christ with a harlot. 
That's why he said, don't you know that, that it said that uh, for two, saith he, shall be one? And he's, again, he's talking about our bodies being joined together and, and knowing one another, as we'll say it in a polite way, um, and join, taking your members of Christ and joining them to a harlot. Should you do that? Think about that in fornication. I mean, you could flip it the other way. Should you take your bodies of Christ and, and join it to a whoremonger? Ladies. You know, or whatever other disgusting things that people do. Join it to an animal. A man joining it to another man. A woman joining it to another woman. And call yourself a Christian and say uh, your name in the name of Jesus Christ. Is that appropriate? Is that expedient? Uh, I think God forbid. I think that's pretty obvious. Uh, and so he says uh, in verse 17, again, talking about the oneness we have of God in the spirit. Uh, and how vile it would be to join ourselves in the flesh with such a, a person in fornication. Our spirit is joined as Christians with the Lord. It says in verse 17, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And again, if you remember back to last week's message, what Jesus prayed for us, he prayed that we would be one. Uh, go back into uh, John again. Go back to what Jesus prayed in John 17. Just to remind ourselves in verse 20. says, neither, Jesus praying to God the Father says, Neither pray I these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one, I and them and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved me as thou hast loved me. You see what? We're one with the Lord in spirit. You know, God is a spirit, the Bible says, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And so if you're one with God in the spirit, the Bible said there that the world may know uh, that thou hast sent me. You know, part of the world knowing uh, that Jesus was sent is that we have the Spirit of God inside us, that we are joined by the Spirit uh, with God. And so if we take our bodies and join them with a harlot, use them uh, for the lust of our flesh, use them for fornication or any other sin, uh, we can see how that uh, doesn't do justice to the name of Jesus Christ as a Christian. That's not expedient. Look, uh, you're saved, you're born again. You, have you truly been born again, believing on Jesus Christ, and you go out of here today and you commit any sin or you commit any fornication, uh, you're not going to be condemned. Uh, you've been born again. You will have uh, eternal life. Now, I'm not saying that there's no consequence for that here on this earth. Uh, the Bible says, whom the Lord uh, loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Uh, so if you're a disobedient child of God, uh, he will chasten you here upon this earth for your disobedience. You go out and sin, well, you're going to reap what you sow. Uh, you, you commit big sins, you're going to reap big punishments. Commit little sins, you'll, you'll, you'll reap little punishments, but God is going to chase you because he loves you. He's a loving father. And so many people understand that. Get that in your mind. Uh, we talked to oh, three or four people yesterday who had this misunderstanding that because they were not doing everything exactly as they could. That Jesus shed blood and him dying on the cross wasn't enough to save them. That they had to be coming to church. They had to be doing what they were supposed to and living a sinless life. And you're not going to run into anybody like that who's ever going to be confident about their salvation. Every single person we ran into like that said, we asked them if they knew they were going to heaven. Well, you can't know that for sure. I'm not, I don't think so. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I don't know. Well, you can know for sure. You know, Jesus said, uh, it says in the scripture, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Look, when you're trusting Jesus Christ for your salvation, you know for sure. Uh, because you're not trusting yourself. Uh, Jesus did enough. He died and rose from the dead. If that's what your faith is in, then you know that you're going to heaven because he completed the work. You don't have to do any more work. Um, but... If we want the world to know that, if we want the world to know that Jesus came into this world uh, uh, to deliver us from our sin, 
uh, then we as Christians ought to act like it. How are we going to profit anybody if we go and we just act the way that they do and we use these bodies the same way that they do and, and, and join them to a harlot and use them for fornication? And look, fornication is a big deal, as we're going to see, because the Bible says here it's not just a sin uh, uh, that we do without the body. It's also a sin against our own bodies, uh, that you're actually sinning against your own body. And uh, to further uh, see how serious it is, just flip back. To chapter 5, we don't have to this morning, I already kind of told you about it, but read it sometime. Uh, the reason the person was being kicked out of the church was for fornication. Uh, and he seemed to be openly reveling in the fornication uh, to the point where everybody knew that he was a fornicator and he was just unrepentant about it. And the, the commandment from God, that Paul gave from God is deliver such a one to Satan. You know, uh, cast out that old leaven. Uh, so that you can be a new lump. And again, I think it's because they were more openly reveling in it and they could be leavening the whole lump. Uh, it, you know, uh, hopefully if anybody here, and I don't think anybody here would, but uh, is committing fornication, uh, just better make sure that nobody knows that. I'm not saying you continue in it. Don't do it. But if I find out that you are, well then it's my duty to cast out that old leaven. You're, you don't belong here. You've got to be cast out. Uh, deliver so the body could be destroyed. It said, deliver such a one unto Satan. Uh, but again, you think, man, that's harsh. Uh, doesn't that person need help? That is help. Because if you look through this scripture, and then you, again, you read the second letter of 2 Corinthians, casting that person out and delivering them unto Satan so that they can uh, reap what they're sowing, uh, help that person to repent. And to acknowledge their sin and to get that out. And then they were actually allowed to join back into the church once that happened. You see, somebody that's committing that and casting someone out of church, the whole point is reconciliation. It's not just to flex your muscles and be like, oh, I'm just going to start hauling people out of church. We throw anybody and everybody out here. Anybody that commits these sins here listed in, you know, that's not the point. It's not to say how, see how much of a separated church we are. The point is to try to help that person so that when you cast them out, they'll come to themselves. If they really have the spirit of God inside of them, they'll repent and acknowledge that sin. And then you can receive them back in. And again, I don't think this is just anybody that you hear of or that might be committing fornication or that might be committing any of those other sins that were listed in there. It's people who are openly reveling in this sin and it's corrupting the whole church uh that kind of a person needs to be cast out okay but again that just shows the seriousness of this sin fornication and, and the point that he's trying to drive home here uh in chapter six that's why he says in verse 18 flee fornication flee fornication you know there's some things in the bible we're taught to fight this one we're told to flee not to mess with it. Look, uh, we can underestimate the weakness of our own flesh and uh, try to fight things that we need to be running away from. You know, the Bible says here, flee fornication. Get away from it. Uh, I, I think I've told this story before, but we had an evangelist that came to a Bible Baptist church, and he said he was a, was a pastor. And they had, uh, I think, a strip club that opened up somewhere around the church. And so he decided, he'd never done it before, that he was going to go out and he's going to do some street preaching out in front of the strip club and just try to uh, maybe try to run him off or something. And so he went out there. He said, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't, hadn't street preached before or anything. So he said, I just started to open up my Bible and I've got a bullhorn and I'm just out there just screaming the Bible. And um, he said, after, after a while, the guy ended up sending some of the dancers outside. Like some of the female dancers, like half dressed while he's out there doing this. And so he's telling the church all about it, and he tells them what happened. And he said he was out there by himself one night. Well, the next night, he said there was a lot more men there at the church. And he said they sent the ladies out again, and he noticed there was more and more men keep coming. And he said after a few nights of that, he was like, you know what? This is probably isn't such a good idea. Because those guys weren't as interested in trying to run them off as they were maybe uh, uh, seeing the girls that they were sending out. Uh, see, there's some things that uh, we need to realize the weakness of our own flesh, and we need to flee instead of trying to foolishly fight. 
And, and fornication, we're told here to flee fornication. That every sin that man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication uh, sinneth against his own body. You're sinning against your own body when you commit fornication, the Bible says. In verse 19 it says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Look, keeping that in mind, that this body that we have is the shell, is the temple, is the housing of the Holy Ghost that lives within us. You know, having that verse memorized and uh, having that truth in your heart, in your mind, will help you not to trash this body that God has given us. You know, we know in this body and this flesh dwells no good thing that this body is temporary. But right now, this body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. That every born again believer has the spirit of God living inside them. And so we ought not to use this body for our, our give in to its lustful flesh and desires. We shouldn't use this body uh, for sin. Uh, we ought to use this body for the Lord. It's a temple of the Holy Ghost. In verse 20, it says, For ye are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, that's a strong statement right there. For ye are bought with a price. Look, if you're saved, you've been bought with a price. What is that price? That price is the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That Christ, that price is the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for you on the cross. That price is God becoming a man uh, and being tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. And, and being uh, spat upon and beaten and, and his body hung on a tree uh, so that we can have life. That is the price that we've been bought with. Uh, go with me to uh, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And I could have quoted this. I just want you to see this verse, though. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. The Bible says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. See, we've been redeemed. We've been bought through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now, again, as another side note, uh, there's a reason why we are a King James only church here. Why Good News Baptist Church, we're only going to use the King James version of the Bible. Because in all the newfangled versions of the Bible, they have things missing. And one of the things they have missing is the blood of Jesus Christ. If you were to read this verse and some of the other uh, uh, translations falsely called, uh, they would leave out the, the way we have redemption. Uh, some of them just says, in whom we have uh, redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And they completely leave out through his blood. Look, we've been bought with a price. We have redemption uh, through his blood. Uh, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, with, the Bible says that without shedding, there is no remission. Uh, that's the price that we've been bought with. And that's, again, why we don't use any other version than the King James Version. Because why on earth, other than just trying to corrupt the Word of God and, and just a subtle deception of Satan, would you leave out the blood of Jesus Christ, that price by which we've been bought, uh, uh, what He paid in order to buy us our salvation? You know, and that is the price that we've been bought with, is Jesus Christ. And what he did for us on the cross. We've been bought with a price. That's why it says, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You know, we're going to glorify God in the spirit because it is of God. You know, uh, like we read in 1 John, you, you know, uh, we cannot sin on the, in the new man, in the spirit. Because it's born of God, it's born of righteousness. Our sin comes from our flesh. So because we've been bought with a price, we ought to not just glorify God in the spirit, which he gave us, but we ought to glorify God in our bodies as well. Because we've been bought with a price. And so that just leaves me with one final application as we've gone through all this. Is I want to go back to that verse in 
chap- the small statement there in chapter 12, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So what does that mean? That means if in 2021, if there's some struggles of the flesh that you're having, maybe some addictions that you want to kick, maybe some habitual sins uh, that you've been repeating over and over again that you have been brought under the power of. Look, if you have a sin that's a besetting sin, that's a sin that's holding you back, a sin that you want to get rid of, but you just have not been able to, well, then you're under the power of that sin. You know, if we want to kick the power of that sin, then this, this is going to help us. Look, realizing that, look, our bodies are belonging to Christ, that we've been bought with a price, uh, and that we need to exercise some temperance, some self-control. Uh, and let's go to one last scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. The Apostle Paul says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He's talking about self-control here, about temperance. And he's using a, a race to illustrate this. He's saying, look, don't you know that all, everybody that runs a race, they run all of it, but only one receives the prize. Look, you, you could have a race. I used to run track cross country, and sometimes in these road races. I mean, you could have thousands of people. Thousands of people who trained and spent a lot of time uh, running and trying to get in shape for that race. But only one of those thousands is going to cross the line first. Only one's going to obtain that prize. But yet yeah, all those people that lined up in that race, most, to most degree, uh, sacrificed and trained and participated and ran that whole race uh, with knowing that only one person is going to cross the line first. Not just that, in verse 25 it says, is every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. When you think about striving for mastery, you know, I think again in athletic terms, when you see some of these professional athletes, some uh, I like watching sports uh, documentaries. And uh, some of these, I used to like watching prize fighting, like MMA fighting and boxing and things. And I really liked watching some of the behind the scenes stuff that they would do before, where they would go behind the scenes uh, throughout the week and what these, these people did in preparing. And their whole life, they're striving for mastery. They're striving to, to be the best possible fighter or runner or basketball player, whatever you name it, even uh, maybe musician, uh, that they can be. So their whole life is revolved around this. And it's funny, some of these uh, fighters who you think are lugheads, I mean, they're, they're literally dedicating sun up to sun down to, to, to mastering uh, how to fight. Uh, they cut out all the bad things out of their diet. You know, they're eating nothing but lean meats and controlled portions. Uh, they don't drink any alcohol. They don't smoke. They're not doing any drugs. Uh, they'll even, some of them give up, they'll give up fornication. They'll literally give up fornication or are involved in any sexual activity so that they can be focused in being the best athlete that they can be. And they do that for a corruptible crown. They can control themselves to achieve what they want to for something that's going to fade. Uh, they could win a fight. They could win a medal. They could win a trophy. They could win money. And in the end, all that's going to burn up and not be remembered. But see, when we run the race for Jesus Christ, when we're fighting the fight of faith, uh, we're doing it for something that's going to last for all of eternity. Uh, we're doing it for something that will not be corrupted, that will not fade away. And if they can control themselves and exercise temperance for a corruptible crown, then ought we not to for an incorruptible, for something that's not going to fade away? And that's why he says we don't fight uncertainly. 
uh, uh, you know, it, that's why the Bible says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Nothing you do in the Lord is going to be in vain. And that's why in verse 27 he says, But I keep under my body. He keeps his body under control, and he brings it into subjection, lest by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. He said, I'm not, I don't want to be preaching the gospel to other people and teaching them the way, and I'm cast away because I'm not controlling myself, because I'm not controlling my body and the lust of my flesh. We're, trying, we're striving for something uh, far greater than anybody else could in this world. And if no reason other, the work of the Lord and the things that we have in Christ Jesus and what we're pressing towards and what we're looking towards is all the reason that we can kick some of these things. We can bring our body under control and bring it into subjection uh, because it's the Lord's. It's been bought with a price. We are his. And so if you have something that this year you, you're wanting to kick, you're wanting to get rid of, you want to... Don't be put under the power of it. Realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, that ye are God's. Do it for Christ's sake. Uh, Riley, you can come on up.